Greetings everybody and today I have a short little complex analysis snack for you guys. We're going to be evaluating the inverse Laplace transform of 1 over square root of s. So I've done a couple of videos on the inverse Laplace transform at like the start of last year and yeah we're going to be using some results from there um, with this calculation today. So let's just jump straight into it. How is the inverse Laplace transform defined? It's equal to 1 over 2 pi i. Then we have the integral running from gamma minus i infinity to gamma plus i infinity where gamma is some real number. And then we take our function, which I'll write in this case as s to the minus 1 half. And we multiply by e to the s times t and we integrate to uh, with respect to our variable here, which is s. So in this way, all our s's are gone after we integrate and we're just left with a function of t, which is exactly what we want. Um, so gamma over here, you have to be careful with your choice of gamma. If your function has poles, then this gamma must be chosen such that you kind of enclose all of the poles in um, the Bromwich contour that we're going to be using. Um, but in this case, we're taking a look at the square root or one over square root. Um, that doesn't have poles that has branch points. So what we're going to do, so we're going to draw out the complex plane roughly here. So this is our branch point at ex exactly zero. And we're going to have some branch cuts and we're going to orient the branch cuts, well, um, probably in this direction because we want our integral here um, to be on the right hand side. So the real part of this line is well, just gamma. And then we're going from all the way at, down at minus i infinity up to i infinity. So to evaluate this, we're just going to consider the finite case and we're going to try to form a contour around this somehow. Um, now, usually we'll just do the Bromwich contour. So we'll just complete this with like a circle that goes all the way around. And then we would have poles in here or something. So we can use residue theorem. However, um, we have a branch cut, which um, is problematic because we can't just cut all the way through. So what we're going to do to evaluate this integral here, so this integral um, along with one over two pi i recovers the inverse Laplace transform. To evaluate this, I'm going to construct the contour as follows. So we're going to um, start by going up and around. Now we're gonna hit this branch cut and we can't really go through. So let's do a detour around. So we're gonna go back in and to go around zero and we're gonna go out again and then we're gonna complete the contour from there. Now notice the nice thing about doing this, if you take a look at this contour C that we just constructed, um, it's holomorphic everywhere inside its domain, which means by Cauchy's integral theorem, um, the integral over C is equal to zero. So let's write that down. So we know that the well, integral over C is equal to zero, but we can decompose this integral over a bunch of these paths. So we know the integral over C. First of all, we have this integral, which is the integral from gamma minus i infinity to gamma plus i infinity. Then we have plus the integral over this arc here. Maybe I'll just call it gamma one and gamma two or something like that. Um, so yeah, gamma one and then plus the gamma two. And then we have the integrals along these upper and lower paths here, which I'll call psi one and psi two. So plus integral over psi one plus integral over psi two. And then we also have this integral over this little um, loop in here. Um, we already, usually I call this a gamma, we already used gamma here. So why not call this omega, for example? So we have plus the integral over omega. Perfect. So these are all our integrals. Now, a bunch of these are actually going to evaluate to zero in the limits as our radius here approaches infinity. And as this radius epsilon approaches is zero on the inside. So first of all, notice that this integral over omega, it's encircling a branch point, which means as if we make the radius really, really small as it approaches zero, it's going to vanish. Now, same for these two integrals, gamma one and gamma two, as you kind of blow everything up, these are going to vanish as well. And this actually comes from the lemma um, that I proved in one of our previous videos. I'll link it in the description for you guys if you want the proof for that. So that comes from the lemma. Um, yeah, so these are going to vanish as R approaches infinity. And what are we left with? We're left with the integral over, well, this integral, which is what we want to evaluate, being equal to 
um, negative of these two integrals because we can bring these to the other side. So basically we can, instead of evaluating this integral, um, if we take these two integrals to the other side, we have that this integral that we want to evaluate is just equal to minus the integral over psi 1 minus the integral over psi 2. So instead of evaluating this integral, we can just evaluate to these two integrals. And these are not too bad to evaluate, as we'll find out later. Okay, so how do we do this here? So let's go back over here. So this was just um, the contour integration stuff. We're basically done with that now. Um, let's go back to what we want to evaluate. So this is equal to now, one over two pi i. Then we have, so this integral that becomes minus, we can probably factor out the negative there. Um, we have the integral over psi one of this function. So what is the integral over psi one going to be? Well, psi one, it's going from minus infinity to zero. So these two paths in the limit, they're going to approach the branch cut from above and below. Um, now, this psi one is going from minus infinity back to zero. Okay, that's good. Now, here's the problem on this interval, s to the minus one half is not real, it is complex because, um, well, it's pretty obvious you can't square root real numbers, or actually you can't square root negative numbers um, because you will get complex numbers. So in fact, we have to rewrite this in polar form if we want to make a bit more sense of this. This is something we can do. So we can write s to the minus a half as the absolute value of s raised to the minus one half. So this is the modulus if you want. And then we have times the argument, so e to the i, and then we have the argument of this function as we approach from above. Now, what happens as we approach from above? We're going to approach an argument of exactly pi. Um, so we're going to have e to the i pi here. So I forgot to write this down, but we're assuming that arg of s in this case is on the interval minus pi all the way up to pi. So this is going to be e to the i pi. Then we also have to raise this to the power still. So this is a minus one half. Um, so yeah, this is how we can write s to the minus one half in polar form. Then we also have e to the st and then ds. So we don't need to touch that part. Um, what else do we have? We have a plus now because we factored out the negative. Then we have the integral over psi two. Now what will that become? Well, psi two, that's starting at zero here and then going back to minus infinity. So zero to minus infinity. Um, we're going to rewrite s to the minus one half in the same way. So we have s to the minus one half, then e to the minus i pi this time because we're coming from below. And then we have to the power of minus a half. Then we have e to the st ds. Okay, so this is our inverse Laplace transform so far. Looks like an absolute mess, um, but it's not too bad. So now what do we have? We have minus one over two pi i. On this first integral, I wanna get rid of this minus infinity. We don't really like minus infinity. So let's do a little bit of a substitution or a remapping of our variable. We're going to basically map s into minus s. So what is that going to do? First of all, our bounds are going to pick up negative. So we have the integral from infinity to zero now. So just putting negatives everywhere. Um, in here, we're going to get the absolute value of minus s raised to the minus one half. Um, but negatives don't matter in absolute values. So we can just simply write this as s to the minus one half. Um, and also notice as well, because now in, on the interval zero to infinity, well, infinity to zero. S is positive, so we don't need absolute values here. We can just write it as s to the minus one half. Um, e to the i pi to the minus one half. That is going to give us minus i. Then we have e. Now s turns into minus s, and then we have a t, and then ds turns into minus ds. So we're going to have a ds here, and then the minus I'm actually going to use to flip the bounds, so to reorient it a little bit. So we're going from zero up to infinity now. Okay, and we're basically gonna do the same thing on the second integral as well. We're going to have plus yet again. Integral from zero to infinity, so minus infinity changes to plus infinity. Um, same spiel with all this stuff here. So we still have 
s to the minus one half because we put negative here in here that doesn't matter then s is positive because we're on this interval and so on very similar to the arguments before um, e to the minus i pi raised to the minus one over two that's going to become i which we can put out here um, and then we have e s turns negative and then we have a t ds turns into minus ds and we're going to put the extra negative factor out over here okay so that's what we have so far and this is really quite nice because you may notice that these two integrals are the exact same thing so let's write it like this so this integral is the same so minus i times integral minus i times integral that's the same thing as minus 2i times the integral so let's forget about that part um and yeah we have negatives and negatives which will cancel 2 and 2 which will cancel i and i which will cancel and what we're left with is just 1 over pi and you may notice one thing the integral from 0 to infinity of s to the minus a half uh, times e to the minus st ds that looks like the Laplace transform the normal Laplace transform but the variables are just switched around so we can kind of rewrite this as the Laplace transform the forward Laplace transform of 1 over square root of s but with respects to the variable t now um, and that's pretty funny in my opinion because to evaluate the inverse Laplace transform of this function we actually need to know what the forward Laplace transform is and then we have this extra factor of 1 over pi um, now I don't think Laplace transform of 1 over square root of s is a standard result um, if you know what the answer is then you can just plug it in straight away but let's just re-derive it a little bit over here um, because yeah I don't think you'll find 1 over square root of s on the Laplace transform tables or whatever you use so let's figure this out so what are we trying to find so all of this stuff over here this is still equal to 1 over pi and then we have the Laplace transform of 1 over square root of s but with respect to t so that's what we've found so far so let's go back to the definition of the Laplace transform. So we have the integral from 0 to infinity, 1, we'll actually write it as s to the minus a half, and then e to the minus st ds. Okay, so how can we evaluate this? I want you to notice one thing here, which is that this almost looks like the gamma function, because the gamma function we need e to the minus um, our variable here then we have our variable raised to some power it looks very similar to the gamma function so what I'm going to do uh, well we're really off because because um, instead of having just a single variable here we have s times of something so what I'm going to do is I'm going to let st be equal to u so some new variable u and notice both s and t are positive so u is also positive um, so no domain issues there um, so what is ds going to be? ds is going to be, well, t times ds is going to be du. So ds is going to be du over t. Okay, and if you plug 0 and infinity into this function, well, u is also going to go from 0 to infinity. So now we have 1 over pi integral from 0 to infinity. s, what does s become? It becomes u divided by t. So let's write that down. This is raised to the minus one half. Then we have e to the minus s times t, which is u, ds, which becomes du over t. So this is what we have now. Um, okay, so this is going to give us one over pi. Um, now, take a look at what happens. We pick up a t to the minus a half times t on the denominator. So what is t to the minus a half times t? That is simply t to the one half. So we actually pick up one over square root of t right on the denominator here. And we're left with the integral from zero to infinity of u raised to the minus a half and then e to the minus u du. And now this looks much more like the gamma function um, except on this exponent here, we just need one minus something. Um, or well, actually something minus one, but negative a half, we can write this as one half minus one. So this over here, that is going to be the gamma function of exactly one half. And 
yeah, this should be a standard result that everyone knows. Gamma over half is equal to square root of pi. So this, in the end, is going to give us 1 over pi. And then we have 1 over square root of t times the square root of pi. But the pi's cancel a little bit, so this gives us 1 over square root of pi square root of t. Um, and yeah, we can rewrite this as 1 over square root of pi times t. And that is the final result. So, pretty interesting. Um, the Laplace transform of this function is basically the same function, um, except with a different variable, and you also pick up an extra constant of square root of pi. Um, so, not too sure if there's any other functions that have this behavior where you just become an extra constant. And you can do this the other way as well. If you Laplace transform 1 over square root of t, you should get to 1 over square root of s, but with an extra square root of pi added on or multiplied on. So, yeah, pretty cool in my opinion. Um, not too sure if there exists a function though, where if you take the Laplace transform of that function, if you get back to the same function, um, kind of like with the differentiation with the exponential function and so on. Not too sure if this occurs from what I've read or seen somewhere. I don't think it's possible, but um, maybe one of you who are watching do know. So if you do know um, what's going on over here, if this even exists or not, then definitely let me know. So that's pretty much all for this video. Um, not a super long one, um, nice and quick one for you guys. So yeah, up until the next one, have a wonderful day and I'll see everyone later. Bye bye.